Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that help them become more real to us because we believe that helps us draw more power out of them, and we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and I'm so happy to be joined by my friend and colleague, Robbie Taggart. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome, Robbie. It's a delight to be here. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, well, we are just glad to have you with us. Maybe I can tell our audience a little bit about you, and then we'll uh, ask you to tell us a little bit more about yourself. So, uh, Robbie uh, has studied English at BYU, and uh, then also for his bachelor's, and then comparative studies, which is kind of... Uh, growing on the English, I think, uh, especially comparative religious literature from BYU, and then a PhD in theological leadership from the University of Cumberland. Uh, and then you taught uh, seminary and institute for a long time, I think like 17, 18 years, something like that. And we're, we're even the principal of the high school, the local high school here in my area. Uh, and so we got to interact a little bit that way. So that's a little bit about Robbie. You've been with us here at BYU. He's a, he's a, prof a, a professor of ancient scripture for about two thirds of a year now, something like that. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what else should we know? That's the boring stuff. What's the cool stuff? What else should we know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, something that has really shaped my life is I was a punk rocker growing up and oh, that's right. uh, had a, just a deep connection with God on my mission that transformed me forever. And uh, really every good thing in my life comes from saying yes to God in, in a really kind of critical moment. And so uh, I'm a dad of five kids. My wife is remarkable. She's a nurse. I love poetry. So there's a few things about me. Ah, fantastic. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so with all that being said, we are in the middle, literally right in the middle of one of the more powerful and potent texts in the history of the world, I think. Uh, and in the history, if you want to talk about literature, uh, we could spend a long time just talking about uh, King Benjamin's sermon as literature, and it's incredible. But its greatest uh, power is in the the doctrines, the teaching that it teaches. So we're right in the middle of that, and uh, we're not going to restrict ourselves to only chapters four through six, although that will be our emphasis. But uh, we're just looking forward to what you have to teach us. So what's made this real for you, Robbie? Where would you uh, where would you like to take us? Yeah. I, I think that these chapters specifically, and it's interesting, like you say, to start partway through the sermon, but focusing on just the second half actually gives us a chance to really focus on the way that it shows the creation of a really stunning covenant community. Hmm. They've received Benjamin's teachings about the Redeemer, about this enormous love, this message that the angel gave him, that, that Christ is going to come and he's going to experience all that it is to be human. And then on two occasions, in, in chapter four and chapter five, Benjamin's going to seek feedback. He wants to get a sense of what his words and what his message mean to the community. And I, I think that's really important. Sometimes as a teacher, you know, we, we share the things we share, but it's so critical to sense, like, what is this meaning in, in the hearts, inside the souls of the people who are receiving it? And on both times, when he kind of pauses and he, he looks to the people, something really stunning, something really remarkable happens as they they cry out with one voice. So he's he's just taught them about Jesus. He's taught them that outside of Jesus, we're we're lost. There's kind of no hope for us. Yeah. And in chapter four, it says, when King Benjamin had made an end of speaking these words, which the angel had given him, verse one, he cast his eyes round about on the multitude. Behold, they had fallen to the earth. They had viewed themselves in their own carnal state, even less than the dust of the earth. And they cried aloud with one voice saying, oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins, that our hearts may be purified. And immediately as they say these words, there, there's almost this in, enormous burden lifted off them. N nothing happens other than this exclamation of a, a plea for mercy. And then immediately in verse three, it says, it came to pass after they had spoken these words, the spirit of the Lord came upon them. They were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith, which they had in Jesus Christ. And I think this is a, a remarkable moment. In part, I think maybe we've all had a, uh, moments in our lives where we would say they were transformative, they were redemptive, where we have come to know Christ in a way we've never known him before. 
where his atoning sacrifice has been real for us. And, you know, I alluded to this in my, in my intro, but for me, that happened when I was a missionary teaching about Christ's love to people who felt like there was no hope for them. And as I taught that love, the, the message sank into my heart. And I got to this point on my mission where I thought, I don't want to be who I was before my mission. I don't want to live the way I lived before my mission. And God invited me uh, essentially, you know, to do what these people do in, in chapter five. Uh, again, Benjamin is going to teach them some more things, which we'll come back to because there's, I think, really critical to creating beloved community, sacred community. But Benjamin sends among his people desiring to know uh, if they believed his words. And again, verse two of chapter five, they cried with one voice saying, yea, we believe all the words which thou hast spoken. And uh, the, the spirit of the Lord omnipotent has wrought a mighty change in our hearts that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. They, you know, they talk about the infinite goodness of God, great views of that which is to come. They say, we do rejoice with such exceedingly great joy. And they say, we are willing to enter into a covenant. Mm. And, and this is the moment where what Benjamin has been hoping for with this sermon is finally culminated. When, when he tells Mosiah to gather the people, he says, I want to give them a name. Yeah. But he's given this whole sermon without bestowing a name upon this people. And it's not until they are transformed together and they experience the joy of redemption and they express their desire to enter into a covenant that he says to them in verse seven, now, because of the covenant which you have made, you shall be called the children of Christ. And this is the name. This is the identity. This is the way of being in the world that has transformed them. They want to become Christ in the world. Right. And I, I to me, that that moment just feels so important. If if we're trying to prepare for the second coming of the Savior, if we're trying to create Zion, I think we need not just moments when we individually experience the Savior's love and have a desire to enter into deeper relationship with God, but this thing transforms the whole community. And just to share one little moment where the scriptures have become real to me with this, I I uh, have worked with FSY, the church's youth program, and there's this moment at the end of FSY, it's the last night, and you know, kids come in on Monday, and they're just a little uncertain if they even want to be there. And on Tuesday, the spirit begins to work on them, and they, they start having these experiences. And on Thursday, they have these sacred kind of Christ-centered experiences, which kind of feel like this King Benjamin, you know, communal, everyone together and immersive. You know, they're separated from their daily lives, just like these people have come and gathered at this temple. And then on, on Friday night, I remember the first time a friend told me like, okay, we're going to have this dance, the final dance. And then right after the dance, you're going to have your final message. Like as the session director, you're going to talk to these kids. And I thought, in what kind of a state of readiness are they going to be after they just yeah. Yeah. But it, it was remarkable. You know, the, the music stops. They say, go ahead and sit down. And they say, you know, your session director is going to say something. I stand up and I look out at this sea of kids. And there's just this, this yearning to be with God to be taught. And, and you start speaking of Christ and there's, there's tears in eyes and then there's just kids nodding along and, and there is this togetherness. And then you kind of gather in, in little groups and you sing and, and then everyone kind of goes their way. But I, I want, I think this is why we do church. I think this is why we come to sacrament meeting. I think this is why we go to elders quorum and release society and Sunday school so that together our hearts can be open to the message of the Savior's atoning sacrifice, the Savior's redeeming love, the enormity of who he is. And then together we have these sacred experiences that bind us not just to God, but to each other in this covenant belonging, this covenant community. I know you've written a lot about covenants. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. There's there's action that's required uh, to to be transformed. Christ can't transform us with us as passive partners. Um, and part of that action is entering into the covenant, but it's, uh, it's even more, and, and you illustrated it so, so beautifully. And maybe I can just kind of even highlight, uh, a little bit more. Um, 
Benjamin, as you said, he's he's set this up right, especially chapter two. He's telling about there's, you know, they're less than the dust of the earth and so on, and then he teaches them about the answer in chapter three with Christ. But but know what he says, and I find this uh, to be so interesting and powerful. And I'll have to give credit to uh, Paul Hoskinson, who is my Book of Mormon teacher. And this was a quiz question he had. Uh, he had the hardest quizzes, but they were designed to teach you how to think about uh, the scriptures. Uh, verse five of chapter four. And his question was, what was it that, that awakened them to a sense of their worthless and fallen state? Uh, look at the answer here. For behold, if the knowledge of the goodness of God at this time has awakened you to a sense of your nothingness and your worthless and fallen state, right? And then we get into the part you're talking about, the goodness of God and his matchless power and, and so on. Uh, then you you can uh, you know have have faith in him, but but it started with that recognizing the difference between them and God and how much God wanted to do for them and and how unworthy they were of it, but God was going to do it for them anyway, right? But but he he'd gotten them to that state. If he'd gotten them to where they recognized that, but nothing else happened, this would have been a failed story, right? It would have been a little bit like uh, I think that when uh, when Lehi teaches his sons about the the dream that he's had and nephi acts on it he says that's fantastic i need to reach out to god and and have this experience in some way and he does and as soon as he's done with that he comes to his brothers who have had that experience with with uh lately as well to the point where it gave them questions but nephi asked them so did you ask god and like no well, he didn't tell us we needed to ask him right that's where it ended for them and it would have ended for king benjamin's people if they hadn't gotten to this point where, as you said, they, he sees that they've viewed themselves in that carnal state because they've come to know the goodness of God, but they cry with that voice. They cry out and they say, please apply his atoning blood, as you read to us so powerfully, but they do something. And as you noted, they do it together, right? So we all need to do it individually, but we also need to do it together. And we will see if we study the scriptures that the covenant is, is it's an individual covenant, but it is also a communal covenant. And God doesn't talk about saving individuals. He talks about saving people, meaning groups, his people, the, the all of Israel, right? That's what he talks about. And the Book of Mormon is pretty emphatic about that. In fact, I've charted that as, as you kind of get away from that, you kind of get away from the covenant, and then Christ comes back and fixes it. But uh, I think it's so powerful that we see them together enter into this, as, as and you're describing it with the youth in FSY. Uh, we see it. Uh, I was just listening to the church news podcast and listening to the uh, General Relief Society presidency talking about women's conferences where it happens in these groups. There, there is something so powerful about us as a group saying, "God, we." feel this we want this please apply it to us and we are ready to act on it and that is that's what the covenant is right yeah i, I love that can i share a little something just kind of riffing off of your that that nothingness motif that benjamin picks up on please and i mean you were in a band so you should riff so that's good <laughs> can you imagine uh an entire community entering this level of of humility you know, ego is is what keeps us from communion. Ego is what keeps us mm -hmm. from connection, from creating beloved community. We divide ourselves because we argue about things that simply don't matter. And what happens at FSY, like we were talking about, what happens here are these moments where all of that is put into perspective and our lives feel so small. They feel yeah. so tiny and insignificant in light of this overwhelming love this enormity of God. And all of a sudden, all the things I've been quibbling about, all the things I've been worrying about, my whole sort of way I've been trying to build up my, my persona or whatever it is that I'm worried about, it just is, it just doesn't matter. And it is the prerequisite, that humility is the prerequisite for beloved community. It's, it's the prerequisite for this kind of covenant way of being. It reminds me, there's a, a passage in Julian of Norwich's uh, Revelations of Divine Love, so she's uh, this nun who, you know, lives uh, in this tiny little cell and she has the, this series of, of visions. And one of them, she says, um, he, he, God, Christ, showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand, and it was round as a ball. I looked thereon with the eye of my understanding and I thought, what may this be? So she sees this tiny little hazelnut sized circular thing in her hand and wonders what it is. And it was answered thus, 
It is all that is made. I marveled how it might last for me thought that it might suddenly have fallen to not for littleness. If, if that's all that is, I thought that it's all going to just fall apart because it's so tiny. And I was answered in my understanding. It lasteth and ever shall last for that God loveth it. And this really seems to be what happens to King Benjamin's people. They see that compared to God, they really are nothing. Compared to the enormity of, of the being of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the power, the wisdom, the things God comprehends, as Benjamin says, you know, believe in God, believe that he is, believe that he uh, has all wisdom and all power, both in heaven and earth, and that man and woman doth not comprehend all the things which the Lord can comprehend. We get to this moment where we see how big God is and we realize I'm so tiny. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be a discouraging thought except for, as you point out, the love of God. In our tininess, we recognize that we are held, that we are loved, that we are cherished, that despite our nothingness, God adores us. It's that uh, President Uchtdorf quote from October of 2011, where he says, this is the paradox of mankind. Compared to God, we are nothing, yet we are everything to God. While against the backdrop of infinite creation, we may appear to be nothing, we have a spark of eternal fire burning within our breast. We have the incomprehensible promise of exaltation, worlds without end, within our grasp. And it is God's great desire to help us reach it. I think you we can't start loving the way that Benjamin's going to start talking about. I mean, he's going to start talking about the ways we live out loud this community, right? Yeah. But it starts by first knowing, really, I am nothing. And yet I'm beloved. And so if I see other people as maybe insignificant, if I can see them as beloved of God, we're in it's in it's from that place of belovedness. It's from that place of feeling ourselves cherished that this desire to enter into covenant, that this desire to be in deep relationship with this God who already loves us springs, you know, it, it comes, it's born from from that sense of beloved nothingness, cherished tininess. Uh -huh. That's so powerful. So, so powerful. And this is a theme I actually see all over in scriptures, God humbling us and then ennobling us in the right way. If, if we just get humbled, we're in trouble. Uh, we're going to give up. If we just get ennobled, uh, we're in trouble. We're going to be prideful. But if we get humbled and ennobled in the right cycles uh, and, and, and all of it around God, uh, it, it works out well. And, and I have to say, so, you know, I teach uh, Pearl of Great Price, I teach Old Testament. And, and so I teach the creation quite a bit. And uh, as you go through the creation with students, this is almost always one of the things you have to come up against. You see the incredible expanse of creation, and we are so small in comparison, and yet creation was for us, right? And and I think that's not illustrated. If, if I can maybe just jump to another text for a second, because we'd love to just, I think it's, it's useful to take other texts and see how this theme is developed in so many places. I, I don't know that that's illustrated anywhere so well as it is in Moses chapter 1. Uh, right. When Moses sees a bit and and then he has this line, you know, now I know that man is nothing. Uh, and uh, but then we get this. And I, I, I think this is so interesting. I'll just read a couple of verses. This is at the very end of Moses, chapter one, where starting in verse 37. And the Lord God spake unto Moses, saying, and I want you to put yourself in Moses's shoes. Right. And see if you're going to end up feeling like the people of King Benjamin felt. If you see the goodness of God and it awakens you to the, your nothingness, but yet the hope at the same time where you're willing to call out to him for help. The Lord God spake unto Moses, saying, the heavens, they are many and they cannot be numbered unto man, but they are numbered unto me for they are mine. Right. Just that idea. You can't even keep track of these things, but they're mine. So I know them. And as one earth shall pass away and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come. And there is no end to my works, neither to my words. And then as if, you know, you've got this huge expanse he's painted, but then the next line. For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. In other words, I have created things that are beyond your scope to, to your capacity to understand. The scope is so immense, you can't even start to grasp this. But I did it for you, right? So you are insignificant and the center of the universe at the same time. Yeah, yeah. The 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 psalm that comes to my mind as you're talking is is Psalm eight, right? What is man that thou art mindful of him, 
and the son of man that thou visitest him? Or, or what is woman that thou art mindful of her and the daughter of woman that thou visitest her? And then it says this, for thou hast made them a little lower than, and, and, and you know, the Hebrew is Elohim, yeah. the gods, mm -hmm. right? And hast crowned him with glory and honor and made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands and, and has put all things under his feet. It's, it's this sense that, who are we? We're, we're nothing. We're, we're tiny. We're, we're this speck in the universe. And, and when we can see ourselves that way, sort of paradoxically, we sense that, okay, because I'm nothing from this vantage point, I can, I can open myself up to the love of God. And maybe then I can be the love that God wants me to be in the world. It's really kind of striking to me that immediately after sensing their nothingness, um, King Benjamin's going to teach them that, yes, you're nothing, but you're the nothing for whom Christ died. And it really is, you're the everything. Like you say, you're the work and the glory. Every person is of infinite worth. The, the worth of, of the, the price that was paid, right? The, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so you have, starting in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4, this really long kind of if-then statement. Right. He, he says um, in, in verse 11, as you have come to the knowledge of the glory of God, mm -hmm. so you've come to know his bigness. But the way his bigness is manifested, his glory, if you have known of his goodness and tasted of his love. It's not that he's so big that he, you know, we can't reach him. He's unattainable. It's that he's so big that he loves me when I'm so small. If you've come to the knowledge of the glory of God, known of his goodness and tasted his love, mm -hmm. just pause on that beautiful synesthetic phrase. You know, we, we normally feel love. Maybe it's something we experience kind of viscerally, bodily. Uh, but he says you taste it. Something that, uh, you know, we taste delicious things. We taste things that make us happy. We we taste things that, that make us full. Of, if you've tasted of his love, and receive the remission of your sins, which caused such exceeding great joy in your soul, in your souls. I would that you should remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God, your own nothingness and his goodness and long suffering towards you, unworthy creatures, and humble yourselves in the depths of humility, call on him daily, standing in steadfastly in the faith. Verse 12, I say unto you, if you shall, if you do this, so here's the if, mm -hmm. if you do this, if you remember the bigness of God and his love and your nothingness and humility, but you stay connected to him because he loves you, here's this series of kind of consequences, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. I think we read these as if they're commandments, but they're, they're consequences of, of remembering to be in right relationship to God. Right. Right. In fact, maybe I'll, uh, just before you read it so we can really couch this, again, I would argue that the covenant is about relationship with God. That's that's the point of it. It's about that relationship. And so basically he've said remember you don't you don't put much into this covenant. You need to put in what you can. You don't put much into it. But when you do put something into it, then this is what you get out of it. And it's not that it's transactional, you know, right? He's not painted as a transactional thing. He's painted it as a relation thing. When you are in relationship with God, here is what happens because of that relationship. So with that in mind, let's let's keep reading what you were saying. I love the way I love the way you articulated that. It is the natural outgrowth of of being in community with God, being right. part of this relationship. Yes. If you do this, you shall always rejoice. Now, I don't think that means you're not going to have bad days. No. Right? But it's going to be swallowed up. Just like their sense of of falling to the earth and and feeling overwhelmed was swallowed up in this exquisite joy. It, it we're going to have hope in the middle of our despair. We're going to have these moments of, of uh, trust that it's going to be okay because of this relationship, because I'm with God, because I'm that little tiny hazelnut in, in the palm of God, essentially. It's going to be okay. I will rejoice. I will be filled with the love of God. I will retain a remission of my sins. I will grow in the knowledge of the glory of him that created me. I will not have a mind to injure one another. My my antagonism, if I'm living in right relationship with God, my antagonism with other humans is going to diminish because I will see them as beloved, just as I'm beloved. Right. I'll see them as as worthy of 
every honor and respect because they're God's children. Right. Yes. So if you keep that first commandment, which is the really the, the relational part, right? If you love God, the second commandment just happens naturally. Yeah. You love his children. So of course you don't enter them. So sorry, keep going. No, yeah. But but to live peaceably, right? Mm -hmm. To render to every man or woman according to that which is their due. You you're going to to sense the the sacredness. You won't suffer your children to go hungry. You won't suffer them to transgress, to fight or quarrel. And sometimes we're like, I don't know exactly how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I've been working on that part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ever plenty of times I read that verse like, dang, I'm still working. I don't know. I don't know. But, yep. yeah. but as they get older, but, but they get a little better at it usually. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Little by little. I mean, somehow we're going to be transformed in the way that even we maybe interact with our kids. And maybe in time, they'll see a model of of right relationship and and the desire to quarrel will diminish as they develop their own relationship with God as they you know sense the, the sacredness even of their little sister or of, yeah. of their little brother or whatever it may be. Yeah. But you'll teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness, to love one another, to serve one another, verse 15. And I, I think in some ways it's easy uh to to love and want to care for our children. It feels like a natural outgrowth of but, but but I do think it's enhanced by our relationship with God when we sense that we mm -hmm. are deeply beloved and that that it's our existence that God loves. It's, I mean, we're going to make mistakes. We're we're going to do things wrong. But if I keep coming back to this covenant, because Benjamin, he, at the end, he's going to take their names. He's going to do things to keep them. To he says, stir them up in remembrance. Yeah. Like we're we're going to forget. We're going to sometimes fail, even though we're trying to stay in this relationship. Right. But but if I'll keep coming back to it, th then then these are the natural consequences. But then you get to verse 16. And you yourselves will succor those that stand in need of your succor. You, you will run to the aid of to relieve the suffering of you, you will administer of your substance to him that standeth in need. You will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain and, and turn him out to perish. And He's going to, you know, I mean, some of the best lines ever, you know, verse 19, behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend on the same being, even God, for all the substance which we have? And he says, you know, you've been begging for a remission of your sins. Has God suffered you to, to beg in vain? And he says, no. You know, if God is so generous to you, end of verse 21, oh, then how you ought to impart of the substance that you have one to another. He says, all that you have doesn't belong to you, verse 22, but to God. And so he says, verse 26, a phrase that he had said earlier about retaining a remission of our sins. For the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that you may walk guiltless before God, I would that you should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and administering to their relief both spiritually and temporally according to their wants. It sounds a lot to me like Matthew 25. Yeah. Right. Where, yep. where there's this judgment scene. And what is the determination of whether I'm on the right hand or the left hand of God? Well, he says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And, and the righteous answer, when did we do this? And he says, well, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren. Foundational to the teachings of most prophets is the urgent need to, to care for the poor. I remember in October of 2014, Elder Holland taught in, in a talk called, Are We Not All Beggars? Where he's, you know, quoting King Benjamin. He says, down through history, poverty has been of one, one of humankind's greatest and most widespread challenges. Its obvious toll is usually physical, but the spiritual and emotional damage it can bring may be even more debilitating. In any case, the great redeemer has issued no more persistent call than for us to join him in lifting this burden from the people. And that struck me. I remember hearing him say that. No more persistent call has ever come from the mouth of the Redeemer than to help him alleviate suffering of all kinds, physical, material, temporal, spiritual, as, as King Benjamin says here. And, and I just I just did a little search about like the global distribution of wealth, right? Mm -hmm. and, and like, uh, for, from a place of exquisite privilege, you know, I learned that the top 1.1 wealthiest, you know, inhabitants of planet Earth possess 45.8% of global resources. 
One hmm. percent of the Earth's population is controlling forty-five percent of the the Earth's resources, and then the the next twelve percent, which is probably where most of us kind of find ourselves, you know, in in upper middle class or whatever. Next twelve percent wealthiest control about thirty nine point four percent. So thirteen percent of the Earth's inhabitants account for eighty five percent of the world's resources. And and then the lowest, the poorest fifty two percent live off of one point two percent of Earth's resources. Mm. And uh, I, I remember a time in my life where I felt, really guilty when I, I'd hear stories like this, you know, or, or hear just statistics like this. I, I served my mission in, in Mexico and I served in a lot of border towns and there was a lot of poverty. And I saw a lot of one room homes with, with dirt floors, uh, you know, where there wasn't a lot of uh, the, the comforts that, that we enjoy and that we sometimes take for granted. I, mean, I remember coming home from my mission. I, I grew up in a in a comfortable middle class home, but I always every <laughs> this is a silly thing, but every Christmas I felt like I was disappointed because I didn't get all the things that my friends got. You know, yeah. my my parents are frugal and and they they were wise with their money. You know, uh, and I was always just like a little disappointed. I, I, I thought of ourselves as poor, which is silly because we weren't at all. Yeah. But I, but I came home from my mission, and that was when I was struck. I, I remember asking my family on the way home from the airport, like, why are everybody's houses so big? And they're like, what, what yeah. are you talking about? I was like, what do they do? Just And they've only gotten house. bigger, by the way. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's true. And, and I walk in, and I, I really hadn't seen carpet except like in the temple on my mission, you know, for two years. They just kind of don't do carpet. And so I just fell on the floor and started <laughs> rolling in the carpet. And my little sister is just like looking at me like, what are you doing? She's like 12 at the time, you know? And I was yeah. like, carpet, like magical indoor grass. Like I haven't seen this for years. And then I go that night to, to take a shower. And, you know, I walk in in my flip-flops because I never took a shower in Mexico without yeah. wearing flip-flops. Yeah. Just because there was cockroaches or whatever. Yeah. And I uh, I realized like I, I can take, you know, this is a, perfectly clean bathtub. I don't need my, my flip-flops. And I step in and it was November and I turn on the water and there's just a series of miracles, right? Number one, there's water just because sometimes <laughs> there wasn't water on my mission. Yeah. Well, the, the second one is that there's enough pressure to get my whole body wet. You know, I, I remember on my mission, like sometimes there was water, but just a tiny little trickle and I'm just trying to get myself clean. And it was winter and the water was warm and I'm standing there under this sort of magical, warm indoor waterfall and then I realize if, if I wanted to drink this water, it wouldn't make me sick. And I thought of my friends in Mexico and I thought they would honestly think that this is so extravagant to purify the water in our bathrooms. And I started feeling kind of this, this guilt, this sense of like, I, I can't, I can't fix all of the world's suffering. I can't feed all of the world's bellies. And I, I felt guilty about what I have. And then I realized, you know, King Benjamin addresses it a little bit earlier when, when he, he talks about rendering all the thanks and praise, which your whole soul has power to possess. I, I realized if, if I will live in gratitude for what God has given me, my gratitude can turn into generosity instead of guilt. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in that same talk, uh, Elder Holland, he talks about, you know, we do what we can. And that is going to have to be a spirit guided, uh, you know, inspired direction from heaven about how, what can I do in a world of so much suffering, in a world of so much inequality? What am I called upon to do? And I'm wondering, Carrie, how have you wrestled with, grappled with these kinds of questions? Uh, such a good question, and and uh, you're right. Uh, maybe I'll even just kind of say, uh, as you give those statistics, and they're crazy statistics, right? And I guess that uh, my first reaction is, inherently, there's there's not anything wrong with it starting out this way. Okay, you have 
uh, you know, what was it? One one point one percent have how much of it was like fifty eight or some forty five point forty five percent. All right. If it starts out that way, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. The question is, what do they do with it? If they keep it for themselves and don't help others, then there is something inherently wrong with it. If they are helping others, then this should start to even and it. And it doesn't have to even out, you know, perfectly, but we want it to even out to the point where everyone has what they need. Right. And that's what the law of consecration is about. Right. Everyone has what they need. Everyone's OK. Everyone. And, and I in fact, I think that's what the word judgment means is to make everything OK, to make everything the way it should be and 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 make sure everyone is taken care of. Uh, but I find it striking that King Benjamin's sermon is, while the focal point is absolutely Jesus Christ, there's no doubt of that. That is the focal point. But I think if you were to look at numerically what topic, you know, how many verses are about this topic, how many verses are about that topic, I think more of it is about uh, being indebted to God and needing to take care of other people than it is about anything else. Uh, and the next one might be about needing to remember uh, what God has done for us and this kind of thing. But um, this is clearly very, very, very important to God. And uh, and I think we have to figure out how to make it equally important to us. And as we said, I, th I think the answer is what we talked about. If we really love God, then we've got to start really loving his children and, and it should happen naturally, but as you said, we let the, our ego get in the way. So as you were talking about that, I had to think back to when we were all reading, say, 2 Nephi 25 through through 29 and so on. But you get a number of verses in there where God talks about people are seeking for their own welfare, not the welfare of Zion. Or uh, people, uh, ha are they, have, they, they think of themselves because they are thinking of themselves more than others, or they think of themselves as being better than others, and that's why they have all this stuff and they're not giving it to others. And it's about us in comparison to them, right? And that reminds me of President Benson's talk on pride and, and so on. Um, and all, the, the antidote for all of that is love. And it's loving God and then loving others. And and it reminds me of uh, Joseph Smith, who says, you know, as, as you and I can't I wish I maybe I should call up this uh, quote. But uh, it, he basically says, when as you approach God, you want to take all the all the sins and the sorrows of the world and throw them on your back. And you go ranging throughout the world trying to bless the lives of mankind. Right. And I think that is the natural thing when you are filled with love. But the trick is, and I think this is exactly where chapters four and five emphasize, um, the trick is we have these moments. I, I've had moments, as you said, these transformative moments. I've had moments when I've been so filled with the Spirit, I thought, I just never want to do anything wrong ever again, right? Mm -hmm. And and I just want to help people. I'm going to do everything I can to help people and bless people and serve God. And we have those moments where it's real. We're not faking that. The yeah. spirit has overcome us, and that's a real, real desire. But then you're driving home, and somebody cuts you off, and maybe that's about as long as that lasts. I don't know. But but hopefully not. Hopefully we're changed enough that we can then remember, as you'll say, and, and start the cycle over again. I would be absolutely shocked. This is an incredible moment for King Benjamin's people. I would be absolutely shocked if none of them ever sinned again. They had no disposition to do evil right then. But my guess is they sinned again, and that's and Benjamin knew, and that's why he would go through this. Okay, you need to remember this. You need to take care of the poor. All of those things are are, are an interesting cycle. So now I'm going on too long, but I just want to touch on one more thing. This interesting cycle that we get where we should be helping other people because we love them. We love God, and we love other people, so we help them. But yeah. sometimes we forget that love. We forget that. We lose that feeling. We start to focus on ourselves again. And hopefully we've created a habit of continuing to serve them because then the action can bring back the remembrance of the feeling and start the cycle over again, right? You've got to have both parts because you'll break this cycle if you're not in the, the pattern or the habit of doing both parts, the things that make you love God. But then as you're serving, even when you don't feel the love, that will help you to feel the love. Then you'll serve more and then and so on. And that's, I think, what, what Benjamin's talking about. But that's in some ways that that key to not losing the amazing experiences that we have. Yeah, I, I love the way you articulated that. I, uh, I I love what you say about judgment making things right, and I I think it goes along with what Benjamin's saying here about we we sometimes judge people because of the circumstances that they're in, mm -hmm. right? And and he says, you know, uh, he says perhaps you will say this man, this is verse seventeen, has brought upon himself this misery. 
But I say unto you, whoever does this, this has great cause to repent, and except he repents, he has no interest in the kingdom of God. We're, we're, we're trying to build a kingdom, a new kind of kingdom, where we judge what is needed rather than what is deserved, right? Where, where we see another person as, and maybe we're tempted to see them as nothing, mm -hmm. but we have this corrective. I've seen myself as nothing and yet fully beloved. So if I am tempted to see them as nothing, they're yet fully beloved. And so now I can judge, like you say, it, it comes from this place of love. My service has to come from love. If I can see them as beloved as, as I am, then I can judge what is needed, right? And, and if I can do that, you know, I, I do love, he gives this kind of like little, th there's such a thing as caregiver burnout, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I think we're supposed to share our, our time. We're supposed to share our, our gifts, our talents. The, the, you know, as a teacher, Carrie, I think one of the things you do incredibly is you share your gifts of knowledge, your love of scripture, and you do it so selflessly. You give your time in, in a way, this is, I mean, there are so many people who are in need and you have gifts and riches that, that you offer, right? And sometimes you can probably get exhausted by, by giving too much. And and he says in, in verse 27, he says, see that all these things are done in wisdom and in order, for it is not requisite that a person should run faster than they have strength. But he says, but be diligent. So he's like, don't, don't use this as a justification. Sometimes we're going to give... Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis says something to the effect of, I'm, I'm sure the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. You know, he says, in other words, if our charitable expenditures do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they're too small. Yeah. You know, there ought to be things we want to do, but we can't. I often because say you need to give until it hurts. If you're just giving and just before it hurts, then you haven't done this right. Right. And and that's going to, again, I think the verse 27 really invites me to enter into a dialogue with God. Mm. What does this look like in my life? What do these principles look like in my life? And again, coming back to the community, can you imagine a whole community devoted to eliminating poverty, eliminating suffering, having the well-being of every member of the community as their highest goal? I mean, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about Zion. That is what we're talking mm -hmm. about when we're talking about the kingdom of God. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about the right hand. You know, he he uses the same language as Matthew 25 in, in chapter 5, verse 9. You'll be on the right hand of God if you do these things. You'll, you'll be basically his right hand, men and women. You'll be his helpers. You'll be his participants. And I, I, I want to just share maybe one more quote. This is by uh, Chiko Kazaki, who was in the Relief Society presidency when I was a teenager, and just one of my heroes as a as far as church leaders go. Yeah, mine but too. She, she said, no one is hungry in the next life. So if we want to share food with those who weep from hunger, we must do it in this life. No one is cold or naked. If we want to give a pair of shoes to a barefoot child, we must do it in this life. We know the wicked suffer remorse, but there's no indication in the scriptures that there is grief or loneliness or sorrow among those in paradise. So if we want to give comfort or encouragement, we must do it in mortality. And I think Benjamin's inviting us to act today, in this moment, right? Is there something that today I can do to be an instrument of God's love, to carry my heart through this world like a life-giving son, to 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 help be Christ. I mean, that is the name. He says, this is the name. Because of this covenant that you've made, you're going to be called the children of his Christ, children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. You look like him, you act like him, you have his spiritual DNA flowing through you. His way of being is mm -hmm. manifested in you. You have born, you are born of him. And have become his sons and daughters. We become this whole family of Christ as, as we just simply try to live this, this covenant with God. I, I remember, I repent, I return repeatedly and with others. I, I look outside myself, I serve, I see another as fully beloved, I give, I bless, I help. And, and in that way, I become a small manifestation of Christ in the world. I become grace. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, and think about the word. I mean, it means to, to be anointed, right? So if we're going to think of both uh, of it in terms of, uh, I guess, semantically and symbolically, we could put it this way. You and I and everyone else part of the covenant, we have literally been anointed to go and do for people what they can't do for themselves, to save them in a way that they can't save themselves. That's so the symbolic, that's what Christ does, right? That's the symbolism. And the, the, the text actually means to anoint. We have that job. We're supposed to do that. Right. And, uh, and, and maybe I can take this if it's all right. Um, I want to just kind of, there was something you said earlier that, that just really struck me as, as, uh, important to recognize at least for myself, maybe not for anyone else, but then I have a question, uh, uh, I'd like to ask you about how, King Benjamin's answer is to, to keeping all this through remembering. So as as you were talking, uh, uh, setting all of this up, uh, then it suddenly struck me that one of the the keys, the gospel is often about how we hold certain things in tension with each other. All right. So this is one of the things that seems we need to hold in tension with each other. I need to recognize that in some ways, there's nothing special about me. Every person around me is a child of God in the same way I am. Everyone around me, uh, I'm not better than them. Uh, I shouldn't try and keep more for myself, uh, all these things. And, and so I need to remember there's nothing special about me. And at the exact same time, remember, there is something incredibly special about me because I am a child of God. And that's the tough thing to hold in tension. I am incredibly special and I'm not. And that's, that's, it seems to me, the place where they get. They recognize their nothingness, but they recognize the gift of Christ. And so they both know they're, they're, they're not special, and yet they can become something, right, because of the, the special who they are. But the trick is keeping it there, and we have this theme of remembering that is all throughout four and especially five. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. What is... And I'm springing this on you without any uh, advanced knowledge, so I apologize for that. But uh, what do you think? What What is Benjamin trying to teach us with continually trying to tell us we've got to remember, you know, remember to retain the name, remember your uh, other uh, people and so on and so on. What's he trying to teach us, do you think? Or what does that look like for us? Maybe, I guess. I don't know. However you want to respond to that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's easy, like you say, to have these sacred experiences and then to to be caught in what seems like the bigness of our lives, right? The the immediate problems, the immediate challenges. Mm. And I, I think he's inviting us to to come back over and over and over again, to be held in his hands as a as a tiny little beloved nothing, but to to find ways and places to connect with God over and over and over again. So that we just keep recalling our divine identity, recalling our covenant devotion to community, recalling why we are on this planet. And and I, I just think we have lots of things that are built in for us. You know, our, our days should be punctuated with these rhythms of connection with God, our, our prayers, our opportunities for service, the use of our gifts. And, it, and if we are constantly sensing our gifts as Christ gifts, as little shards of divinity that aren't mine, I mean, the, the way Benjamin said it was, you know, uh, your substance doth not belong to you, but to God, to whom also your life belongeth. Your whole life is a gift. So every every capacity, every skill, every thing that you have to offer this world that is that is special, that is unique, because there's never been another person like you in the history of ever, right? But if you'll constantly remember the source of that, that it comes from God. And constantly remember that you are beloved of God, and that every other person is beloved of God. Then we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna keep kind of correcting, right? And, and maybe the the deviations from this way of being are gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller as I get kind of brought into closer and closer harmony with the heartbeat of God. I mean, ultimately, what I'm trying to become is a, a, a godlike, Christ-like being. I'm trying to become so generous, so selfless, so merciful, so compassionate, so loving that that I can become through the grace of Christ like Christ. Uh, and so and then our weeks are punctuated with sacraments and opportunities to serve in, in callings and uh, maybe temple worship. And there, there are little ways that I that I 
re-member. I remind myself that I'm a member of this covenant community, that I'm a member of the body of Christ, that, that though I might be a pinky, I'm a pinky for Christ, right? That that I, I just keep coming back to reminding myself I'm a member of his body. I love that. And that may be my new phrase. I'm a pinky toe for Christ. That's, I like that. But no, that's that's beautiful. Wonderful stuff. Well, what else? Uh, I mean, we'll have to wrap up pretty soon here, but what else uh, do you want to talk about in these uh, these beautiful passages? I, I think really, I think we've done a nice job covering it. So, I mean, maybe the last verse is just uh, chapter five, verse 15. Therefore, here, here, here's the takeaway. I would that you should be steadfast and immovable. Don't, don't move from that relationship with Christ. Don't move from that sense of being held and beloved. Always abounding in good works, that Christ, the Lord God omnipotent, may seal you his, that you may be brought to heaven, that you may have everlasting salvation and eternal life through the wisdom and power and justice and mercy of him who created all things in heaven and in earth, who is God above all. Amen. Stay in that relationship. Stay in that relationship. Stay connected. Stay dynamically acting out this discipleship and you will be sealed his you that relationship will be forever bound and and the community will be forever bound together and uh, th through him through his grace his power his mercy beautiful wonderful so so powerful thank you so much uh, stay in the relationship no matter how Rocky, the world is. Stay in the relationship. Thank you for that thought. I I so appreciate that. Well, I'm grateful for the spirit I felt, and I've been moved upon to to be kinder to others, to increase my relationship with God, to to do so many things. You've you've inspired me and and uh, motivated me, and and uh, I've felt the spirit, and I'm sure that's happening for our audience. And so we hope that our audience members will take something that they've felt and thought, and and uh, do something about it. Write it down. Write down something you're going to do. Uh, share it with someone else, share it with them in person, share it with them on your social media channels, uh, share it, you know, of course, by liking and downloading and rating and reviewing and all those things that help us, but find ways to share uh, not only what you're going to do, but what you've learned and thought and felt as you've listened to, to Brother Tackard here. Uh, just share uh, share that with someone. We hope you'll also join us next week. Going to be uh, Lamar Newmeyer, my co-host, and I uh, going through Mosiah chapter 7 through 10, all sorts of fun stuff in there. So we hope you'll join us then as well. So thank you again so much, Robbie. I just, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Gary.